There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NASPD webinar series. My name is Hannah Cleveland, and I'm hosting today from the Upley Institute for Parks and Public Lands here at Uni Indiana University. Um, today's webinar is Fostering Innovation, and we have Ron Olson, Chief of Parks and Rec, and Maya Turek, um, Resource Development Specialist, Specialist from Michigan DNR, presenting today. Thank you. Well, we'll get started. Uh, the uh, topic of innovation, it's kind of one of those things that people talk a lot about, but actually how to apply it. What we're going to do today is talk about where we started from with our, uh, our uh, situation and apply the real life story that we had and um, why innovation became a very uh, necessary part of the process to uh, enable us to do what we needed to do and protect our core services and all that. So uh, just to set the stage, uh, of course, we're the Michigan State Parks and Recreation System. We have a, uh, a large system, uh, 103 state parks now, and we have uh, 12,500 miles of trail and, and 19 harbors and 1,300 boat launches that we manage and we have a many diverse facilities, some of which we'll talk about uh, during the presentation. So in order to do this, uh, I, in 2005, when I came to become the Chief of Parks and Recreation, uh, what you see on the slide here is where we started. And uh, literally, we were on the hot seat. I started this job in January of 2005 and our fiscal year starts on October 1st. And they told me that we were about a million and a half dollars short uh, in light of the fact that $9 million of general fund, the last general fund support for state parks was eliminated uh, just to run that segment, which was about uh, close to a $55 million operation at that time. That didn't include trails and the other, other things. So in order to get started, you know, $1.5 million is, is, a, is a large amount, but in the scheme of things seems small, but to cut that or to find ways to deal with that is, was the challenge. So what we did is after I started and realizing that the, the staff had already and the people had already identified $750,000 of ways to reduce expenditures, that I, after I analyzed the budget after being on board for a little while, I realized that it was $3 million over budget or we would finish the, the budget overspent by $3 million based on our revenue collected. Um, so uh, we commenced to the, the, the figure this out. So some of the things that we also learned along the way that we identified the fact that we had well over 30, $300 million of infrastructure work to be done with an aging park system that many of us have and uh, uh, so forth. One of the things that we, we did, of course, on the, on the expenditure side was looking at uh, the easy ways to do things. Some of them included not filling full-time jobs, the repositioning to uh, summer or more uh, short, shorter term employees, seasonal types, and that sort of thing. Um, also, we knew that uh, um, we had to do more. And so one of the things that, just to structure it, one of the things that they never, they didn't think about was in our, our uh, uh, whole accounting for revenues versus expenditure and the fact that we had a constitutionally protected funds, that raising revenue was just as important as addressing efficiencies and redu reductions, but the track that everybody was on to, was to cut. Well, we knew that we had to be careful with that so we didn't harm the system. So when I came, I told the staff, we gotta roll up our sleeves, that uh, we, we can, we're gonna work on things we can control. It's obvious that the state of Michigan just reduced the budget by $9 million for whatever reason, and because that was a time when Michigan was sailing into pretty tough economic times, which bottomed out in 2008, but this was the beginning of the 
spiral down. And uh, so there wasn't going to be any bailouts, particularly when public school funding was going down and lots of other things. So there was a need for repositioning what we did and all of that sort of thing. So um, at any rate, one of the things that we uh, set out to do was to say, one thing we can do is to be more relevant to more people. We have a system where people buy motor vehicle permits to get in the park, as well as, at that time, daily permits and the like. And so we said, well, if we can grow the number of people doing that, we can grow the number of people at camp. That way we can, we can or find other uh, opportunities to be more relevant that we can grow some of our uh, pot of money to figure out what we can do. So let's go on to the next slide. You want to go on to the next one, Maya? There we go. So what, one of the things that I did that we always know is that uh, the, the people that know the operation the best are the employees themselves. So one of the things that I did immediately after I started and he, and was to, to uh, prepare a survey that went to every single employee, regardless of their level, and said that, we were, that I'd like to have them respond and send the responses directly back to me, which uh, we assured folks that it would be confidential. We asked a variety of questions, um, you know, looking for ideas, what are things that you wish for? If budget wasn't an issue, what would you, what would you like to do that you can't do now? Are there any rules? Are there any regulations? Are there any kinds of uh, things that are inhibiting uh, you from advancing what you'd like to do with a with the big goal of trying to address this um, financial challenge that we had? And so we uh, uh, gathered up and had a number of questions that were there, we said if you had to, you know, if you were in charge of cutting the budget 10%, what would be your priorities? How would you go about it? And what do you think are the proverbial low hanging fruit? But on the flip side, what are the revenue opportunities that we could employ or things that we could do uh, that that either are, that are fit our mission and are, are legal to be able to uh, it, uh, address the, financial challenge that we have, but still serve the customers. Well, and so anyway, we, we came back uh, after doing that, and many, many great ideas came out of that survey. Uh, and it was very evident to me that we needed a way to inspire uh, challenges and to allow the staff to do some things. Because beforehand, uh, this is a very top-down militaristic organization and people were really uh, curtailed from doing some independent things and were not given much latitude to operate and you could tell that by the surveys. So that's a big ingredient that of a takeaway is to to understand the atmosphere that you're in and is it does it embrace new ideas and are you able to not only embrace them but deliver on on uh, the things that people come up with that are reasonable uh, or willing to go to bat to change rules or whatever it is to find other ways to make things happen. Um, one of the ideas that came out of this is somebody said, well, why don't you, uh, for example, one of the, this led, led to this recreation passport that's gotten uh, national attention uh, what, what it basically was is somebody said, well, why don't you, instead of selling motor vehicle permits, that people just come to a park or, or uh, go online and or come into our offices and buy them on an annualized basis from January to December. What if we were to tie them to registrations of vehicles? We said, ah, that's an interesting idea. I never thought of that. So we did, uh, I'm just using that as an example. And we also had a, an advisory committee of citizens that were appointed to help us. We, they were rolling up their sleeves. So we threw that out to people and along with a number of other ideas. So we pursued it, found out Montana was doing a similar thing and had great success with it. And so what we did is we customized it and uh, worked on it for uh, a number of months to try to uh, hone it out and make it 
so it would work for us. And ultimately, it led to uh, legislation being adopted to allow us to do it, but the ingredient there was in a voluntary fee. And the results, simply put, uh, compared to the revenue that we did collect, we had about an $8 million positive swing on our revenue. Uh, another thing we did is examined our camping fees and, and uh, applied a market rate basis on that. And we did increase our fees to help us there. So that was another element that we uh, that resulted because uh, some of the staff had commented on the fact that they felt that our fees were not um, keeping pace with what it cost us to produce. And, and keep in mind in our, that's particular business that off the road or RVs, uh, this was at a time when, when these huge RVs were evolving and on the upper uh, end of the market, people were buying these and traveling after they retired and the amount of retirements were increasing despite the fact that the economy was not so good, but that was a growth thing. And so we were finding that people were outstripping our electrical demands and because uh, they had air conditioners and all kinds of stuff. So we definitely felt that we needed to uh, start down the path the right size those fees as well. Let's go on to the next slide. I'm going to do the next, there we go. So some more things that we did out of this is we uh, created a couple of things. One of the things I thought, well, along with the things I mentioned, oh, I said, uh, what about um, if we set up and we took, at that time we had 97 state parks. And I thought to myself, what would it take to raise a million dollars? So we divided a million dollars by 97 and came up with approximately uh, um, $15,000. Uh, and so we said, all right, every park, every supervisor, and uh, which are divided in, we're divided into eight districts, we said, all right, every one of you have to come up with a way to either reduce without cutting services, and be more efficient, the value of $15,000. Or if you could get sponsors or partners or people to donate or provide some service that equals $15,000 or some other uh, efficiency matter. Uh, for example, if you could find another way to get stuff done or have volunteers do some things or whatever it was. Whatever it was, and I told them as long as it was, it was fit our mission and it wasn't illegal, we would consider it so out of that, we raised about $700,000 of new opportunities that saved us or added revenue. We also then came, and that was kind of a target of opportunity, if you will. We then uh, talked about creating uh, green initiatives. One, what that means is we said, all right, uh, energy is a commodity that we're going to, we have to pay for electricity, uh, natural gas, all the types of utilities that we have. We said, that's something we can control. And if we could be more efficient with the things that we do, then we, uh, then we save money. So our green initiatives formed. We had staff that were eager and interested in energy conservation. And um, this, these folks signed up and they did a bunch of research and looked into things. I used to work in the city of Ann Arbor and we had a very robust energy conservation program. So we brought in some people that helped us, guide us, and there's a lot of information out there. And they developed a, a booklet of, 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 for example, if you switch from an incandescent bulb to a compact fluorescent, how much savings that made. If you insulated walls better with our values, uh, if you put so much in a wall, it would give, yield excellent investment. And then we started exploring unique heating systems and stuff like that. And so we said, and then we developed some parameters and different things like that. We said, if you could save, um, if you can come up with a five-year payback uh, and do a business plan for this, if we had, in, uh, came up with some money and invested in your idea and we could get a return within five years, We'll consider it. So in, keep in mind, we had a very tight budget. We set aside some funding and uh, set, told the Green Initiatives Committee, 
and we created some forms and all that. And people then started looking around for things and used our the guide that they put together and uh, started applying. And then we sorted them out and invested in things. Some of the op some of the yield occurred where we had uh, a transformation of lighting. Some even went to LED lighting, which at that time in 2005 and six were still uh, you know a developing uh, proposition. There wasn't many choices. But going to compact fluorescence was a big deal and adding the insulation. And we put motion control timers in a lot of places that didn't have them. We were very uh, sticklers on, on exterior lighting at night to make sure that the lights were off and that they had timers. So we weren't depending on manual things. And we looked at some of the buildings we had and asked if they were, some of them looked at, said we over overlamped bathrooms and some had skylights even though the lights were on so we had the proverbial low-hanging fruit if you will so we examined a lot of stuff also we had some interesting things that we had people that got creative and did some research on geothermal heating systems and we actually have probably one of the only lighthouses that have living quarters in it at east tower state park where we invested uh money in a geothermal heating system and today that still runs and we're, we save all the time and it was a huge savings. Now geothermal didn't work everywhere, but we did. We put some heat pumps in, some other kinds of stuff and uh, that really worked well. Anyway, the results, five years went by with that of what we invested. We ended up investing uh, probably um, oh, 200, uh, I think it was about a million two. We were saving about $200,000. Uh, and what we did is we compared the savings against the, um, uh, the inflation of utility rates over five years. And I, I said that wrong. We actually saved over five years $1.2 million. And we, it cost us probably 200000 that we put in. So anyway, it, it, it did yield a savings. And then we told the staff that whatever savings that we would have, you would keep that and they could redeploy their utility expenses and that, that occurred. So that was a positive. And then, uh, one of the, then we went on to, and said, well, why don't we do a challenge? Uh, we call it the Chief's Challenge, not a very creative thing. And we said, all right, what if uh, we had, uh, we encourage staff with ideas. We said that we'll give you, in effect, a dollar if you could return a dollar and 10 cents after a year. In other words, a dollar and 20 cents, 20% 20 uh, return on the dollar. So what we did, we created this chief challenge and some forms were created. We can provide those to y'all. And uh, uh, we've, uh, so we set aside some other money, 150,000, I think it was, uh, to, as investment money, not cost, but investment. And so we set out to do that. We had a deadline. We said, if it's not, if it's our mission, it's not illegal. You come up with ways that if you want to spend some money and you can guarantee that we'll get a return on our investment somehow, that we'll invest in your ideas. And folks, we gave them a basic outline to do a business plan. And so people took after it. But one result, we had a number of Good ideas come. Some were approved, some weren't. But again, we had a peer panel that recommended these. So it wasn't us saying yay or nay necessarily, but we wanted to have the peer review. And the picture you see in front of you, this Hollywood disc golf, of course, uh, the fellow that Sean Speaker, our supervisor at Holly Rec Area, said, you know, I'm game to try this. So he researched it. And just keep in mind that uh, disc golf, you know, today's world isn't that, you know, that woefully creative idea. But in the state park system, people thought, well, that doesn't belong in a state park. And we argued, so why not? You're doing an activity outdoors. It gets you around in an outdoor area. And what's wrong with that? And so we said, all right, let's go do it. So Sean went off. They built the course. We invested the money. And in the first year, he measured the fact that our uh, at the particular park he has, 
I think you got a, about a $25,000 swing in revenue from additional uh, permits and pass sales to come in the park. And the, he took chronicled the use of the parking lot associated with the, the um, uh, golf course. And there are many days when the weather was kind of off and so forth. That lot was full because it was something that attracted a young adult audience, which is exactly one of the, the types of, of visitors that we were trying to stimulate to provide a relevant activity. And that's what I talked about as a bigger uh, parameter goal. And it worked. And so this spawned and other staff said, oh, let's do that. So we, we have some other of these that spawned out because they benchmarked against what he did. And uh, so that, you know, that was an example. We had some other types of things. We had some special events that were created. Some went out and partnered with some groups and all that sort of thing. So there's a lot of pretty interesting ideas that floated out that got, uh, that got funded. So let's go on to the next uh, slide, Maya. Uh, another thing that we did is uh, we wanted to empower stakeholders. We have groups that are passionate about what it what we have, and one of the staff uh, is an example, not the only one, but worked very hard with the friends group and said, you know, uh, at the time when we had three hundred million dollars worth of infrastructure, sewer and streets and all that, that we said, well, playgrounds get a backseat. Well, playgrounds are an important ingredient to creating uh, a relevancy in a in a park to create an opportunity for young kids to have something to do and to play along with when they're camping or coming for day use or swimming or whatever they do. It enriches their choices about recreation. So what we decided to do was that we encouraged the staff to work with friends group and we created, we said, look, what if we set aside some money to leverage the friends group and we said, Let's put it towards things that we would want. And if you, if they raised, uh, we had grants up to, I believe it's $50,000. And if they raised half of that, we would match with the other half. And, um, and so what you have here is a, um, is a playground that was built at, uh, up in the Upper Peninsula uh, that was created. And Doug Berry worked with the Friends Group and uh, came up with a way they raised funds and, and it enabled us to do a better playground, but it, we cost shared. So it, it gave the friends group and our so-called stakeholders uh, an incentive to do that. And they worked together, they worked with the community and it's been very successful. So that's another uh, avenue is to, is to match and participate. Because typically what you do with groups like this is say, what you, can you do for me? And sometimes it's great when they can do it, but if you can match them and come to the table with them and do it in a partnership, it is powerful. So that, that, um, that's another important segment and, if you will, objective that, that uh, we set out to try to uh, create and stimulate. One thing that I didn't mention that I wanted to talk about just a minute is I did spend some time setting a philosophical uh, uh, format also for a lot of this stuff. There's a book called uh, Built to Last, and there's a subsidiary or a secondary book, great, good to great, some of you may have heard of it. It's written a few years ago now, but the themes of that and the basis of it was that the, it, was a, it was a chronicling and a survey of the 100 best companies in the United States over the last 100 years. And what were the ingredients that that these companies had in common that made them a great success. Well, there's a number of things, of course, that they did, notwithstanding having passionate, great passion, understanding your mission, uh, understanding your customers, but also having employees on the bus and getting them on pointed in the same direction. Uh, I, being on the bus is literally being together and running together and not, uh, uh, second guessing or not committed. And uh, that's what we set out to do. And that was why we wanted to engage the employees. So that's another takeaway is getting the employees and getting the, the stakeholders on the bus 
and steered in the same direction and believing in why we're doing it and uh, why we're doing it and, and then how we're going to get there and uh, working together to, to spend event energy and effort efficiently. The other part of the theme of the book of the success of the study was those that stimulated progress the best were also the ones that succeeded the best. That means you can't stand still. That means just because you've always done it that way doesn't work. And we, we even made buttons up and gave them to the staff and we wear them at meetings and say, uh, with a slash through and it says, because we always did it that way. Now it sounds kind of corny, but people glommed onto that. And we had pencils made up, we gave out that said, beyond the bus. And uh, so, you know, it's things like that that we tried to kind of uh, make a little light of, but it got people to, to, to uh, kind of create a little peer pressure and things like that. So let's go on to the next, Maya. So I'm gonna turn this over to Maya and let her tell you, she's gonna dive into a little bit more about some of the cool things that have been done that frankly came out of this. And I just wanna, before Maya starts, I wanna tell you that Maya is a product of our investment. She, you're seeing a real live investment here in front of you on the screen. And we, at a time when we had staff uh, crying for some more staff and different things, and yep, we had reduced some, we didn't fill some jobs and maneuvered around. I said one of the things we needed was to develop uh, partnerships and develop our recreational uh, uh, programs and things to make us more relevant to, uh, uh, to our constituents and our people uh, in general and to those that don't come so that we can grow uh, ourselves. And we knew that there was a lot of emerging recreation and the DNR frankly was still thinking that here, here we are, come and get us. We camp, we hike, and you uh, go fishing. And, uh, you know, and, you know, and uh, you walk around and, uh, but a lot of newer recreation uh, wasn't really embraced the way we felt it should be uh, um, and so forth. So Maya, go ahead. So uh, when I started, I started as a uh, recreation programmer and I was the only one for the division. And when I originally read my job description, it, it said uh, create new opportunities for people to come to visit parks. And they either do it through events or through uh, other campaigns. And so um, when we were looking at, again, Ron talked a lot about creating re relevance. And when we look at creating relevance, we started to think about how do people think about parks? And a lot of times in Michigan, people thought about our state parks as, well, that's where you go for your family vacation. That's where you go when it comes to, uh, you know, going on that camping trip. I always like to joke and say, yeah, that's where I used to go when my family would load us up in the station wagon and we'd go for long weekends. But state parks are so much more than that. And when we're looking at the opportunity to be more relevant, we looked at what's important to the state of Michigan, to the residents and visitors of the state of Michigan. And um, as I'm sure many states are seeing, um, our increasing epidemic of obesity in our state. It was, it was astronomical how quickly childhood obesity was on the rise, not only in Michigan, but, but everywhere nationally. And so one of the objectives that, that Ron wanted us to really focus on was this idea of positioning ourselves as a, as a tool to help combat that. We are part of the fight against obesity. And so we really wanted to position ourselves as uh, places where you can go to be healthy and live a healthy lifestyle every single day. Um, again, you know, while people thought of state parks as being where you go for your week-long camping vacation, where you go and you, you know, maybe get a little hiking in but, and sit around a campfire, sing songs, and eat some more. Um, they thought of, you know, being fit and healthy means I have to go to the gym. So we wanted to change that paradigm. We wanted people to say, I don't have to go to the gym. I could just go and enjoy a trail. I could just um, go and try kayaking because as long as my body is moving, I'm burning calories. So we've uh, forged partnerships with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and the Michigan uh, Department of Community Health. We've also worked with um, the Michigan Recreation and Park Association. We, we're bringing all of these different organizations together to help tell that one same story the whole time. And that is, parks are a place, we are a part of the solution uh, if you are looking for a healthy lifestyle. So 
as we started to do that, we, we saw opportunities with those partnerships, not only to do additional programs and hold additional events, but also to tell our story. And you know, when, you know, earlier Ron was talking about we needed to um, increase our relevance. Well, part of that is just getting to people. And we didn't have a huge marketing budget. So being able to say, um, you know, tell people, hey, we've got these yoga classes, really hard to do. But then if you partner with Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have a majority of the, um, a, ma a majority of the, I should say, they're the majority healthcare provider or um, health insurance provider in Michigan. So through this partnership, we can reach out to their audience. Um, with the Department of Community Health, they work with a lot of low-income families, and that's a really great opportunity for us to tell low-income families about another partnership we have with all of the Michigan public libraries. If you're looking for something fun and inexpensive to do with your family, go to your public library and you can check out a free one-day pass into any of our Michigan State Parks. And then with that messaging, we, we promoted this um, My Big Green Gym, which is, again, instilling that notion that, um, sure, you can go to the gym, but your gym could be as big as all of your public lands in the entire state of Michigan. So in addition to that, we also did some um, in-park in or on-site events. We did a series called Fresh Air Fit, where we invited private fitness instructors to come in and uh, offer classes like yoga, stand-up paddleboard yoga. Uh, we actually had Zumba classes. We had, um, I'm trying to think of what else we did. We just had, a, oh, we had a, a walking, like a Zumba gold, but then a walking and fit, walk fit program. So really what we did is we knew we weren't going to have the staff, nor were our staff experts in yoga, um, but we wanted, again, to get people thinking about state parks as the place I could go for a, a sunrise fitness experience before I go to work. Um, or for a sunset fitness experience while I'm on vacation. So that's really what we were trying to do with that Fresh Air Fit program. And it was great. We were able to get more than 100 uh, fitness instructors from around the state engaged in offering programs. And now some of them actually have gone out on their own and consider our state parks as their studios. And that's their entire fitness. Um, that's, that's where they're located. We are their place of business. And that to us, we thought was quite a success. Um, and then with Rec 101, we have a program where we provide uh, all of the expert instruction with it, with gear at no charge. And we were doing, again, Ron was talking about the surveys, we did some um, consumer surveys and we were finding when you look at why people weren't participating in outdoor recreation, it was perceived expense, lack of gear, fear, and um, you know they didn't really have anybody that they were able to do it with or they didn't have somebody that could be their mentor, so they didn't feel comfortable going on their own. So we created this Rec 101 program to remove all of those barriers to participation. But again, we don't have the staff, nor do we have all the equipment to do all of the possible things that you can do in state parks. So we put it out there to all of our expert outfitters, um, private businesses, it could be charter fishing guides, it could be, um, we actually have a, a forager, it's kind of interesting, she's a nun, but she has a certification in mushrooms. <laughs> So she actually every year holds a, a foraging and a mushroom identification class. Our Michigan Geocaching Organization actually comes in and they offer Geocaching 101 programs. We had um, uh, stand-up paddleboarding, kayaking. We've had a lot of those things, and we were able to do them because these guides who are just as passionate about outdoor recreation and the idea that they want to help be a partner in this fight against obesity and seeing outdoor recreation as a solution for that, they were more than happy to participate. And not only did they participate, they donated their time. So they said, absolutely, we will provide the equipment, we will provide a one to two hour expert instruction experience. All we ask in return is that we're able to talk a little bit about um, what it is that we offer as a business. And then that's what we did. In fact, some of them, we even allowed them to sell, if they sold kayaks, they could sell them on site. Um, if they had experiences that they sold, uh, guided trips like our, our fishermen, um, then we said absolutely provide some kind of a coupon or discount uh, for them to come back again. So it was really, really important part of that is that we knew we couldn't do it ourselves, and so we forged these mutually beneficial relationships to allow us to make it happen. Let me go to the next slide, and Ron, I apologize, there's a little bit of a, of a delay between um, one to the next. Mm -hmm. You want to tell them about the North Face piece that's up oh, there? Oh, sure. Yeah, in the upper left-hand corner, we did have a, uh, we had a, a partnership with North Face. Actually, we had a variety of partnerships with North Face, which is really interesting. 
Um, one year they said, we want to buy uh, free passes for anybody who comes to our store and, and is interested in getting out in the parks. If they didn't already have the recreation passport, they could get basically the equivalent of one. It had a value of $11 and they reimbursed us for those. And they had a cap, you know, they said, this is how many we're gonna provide. So they had a budget allocated for it. Um, but then all of those went out and we were able to see those coming back into our parks, which was really nice. They also provided us with free gear for our Camping 101 program, which was under that Rec 101 series. Um, and they also, they help fund, we have a, a, a mini, not a mini, um, we have a pickup truck and a trailer completely wrapped in these really bright Recreation 101 graphics that helps us tell the story of, you know, here's some ideas for preventing the spread of invasive species. And oh, by the way, this is where, um, this is where you can, you know, follow me to learn more about outdoor recreation. So they helped pay for those wraps. They also helped, like I said, pay for the, for that. Now, one interesting point about partnerships that I know Ron and I have talked about, we don't partner with them right now. We didn't end on poor terms. We didn't have any problems, but sometimes, you know, every business, and this is what happens when you work with private businesses, they have different marketing objectives every year. So when their marketing objectives align with what our mission is, that's when we want to be working with them. We've had a partnership with Gander Mountain in the past. In fact, that Rec 10 or Camping 101 program, that was originally sponsored by Gander Mountain. But Gander Mountain got away from that, and then North Face picked it up. And then North Face got away from it, and now we're working with another organization, another retailer, that they're looking to bring it up. We haven't forged the contract yet, but we are in the process. And so it's just a matter of once you find a partnership, stick with it as long as it's mutually beneficial. But then once you find that maybe it doesn't meet their needs or it doesn't meet your needs, don't be afraid to go and find that next partner that shares that same vision and mission that you have. But sometimes I think we get a little bit stuck on, well, that's the one that I had and oh, they don't want to do it anymore and I give up this program over. Never give up, keep, keep looking into it. Well, Ron, I'm gonna send it back to you here for objective number four. Uh, okay, well, the, um, so a couple of the other things that, um, the, uh, that we did that came out of all of this was, you can see some of the images that one of the things that came out of our practices on the lower left is a, uh, that's the only, uh, uh, state facility that we were aware of that actually we put in eight, uh, electrical generating uh, windmills uh, at Straits Harbor, which is a $12 million marina. It's a state-of-the-art, and it was built with sustainable building practices that have solar tubes, and it has uh, on-demand uh, uh, hot water and a number of other things that relate to that. We actually use that uh, electricity generated, and it offsets a problem between 60 and 80 percent of our electric needs. And in the wintertime, we run bubblers to prevent ice suppression and as well. Also, we, uh, in the upper right, is electric vehicles that we got into uh, that help reduce cost and they were more efficient, quiet, and we weren't going around doing work in much larger inefficient vehicles. Uh, another one that we did is we told the staff, look, you have park, uh, we will buy you mountain bikes or bicycles and go and do your work in the park or patrol on bikes and not get out of these trucks and quit uh, toting up mileage on an expensive truck to uh, go around the park. And we were finding that the customers liked it better because it brought our staff closer to them and they were a little more nimble and also they got exercise at the same time. And so we even had some that bought three wheel bikes, put little baskets on them. And then when they went to go clean or do stuff, they would have all their cleaning gear. And one park saved $8,000 uh, alone from, uh, uh, that they would have spent using a, um, uh, a truck or car through our motor vehicle system. Another thing we did to create some Rel uh, it basically to show customer services when the gas prices shot up well over almost four bucks a gallon, we wanted to keep our people coming. So we did some research and we said, 
you know, if you're camping somewhere up north or have a boat, and if you're um, uh, if you're going to come back within two weeks, we'll let you store your unit on our uh, maintenance yards at the park. And we created these number of stops along major highway routes, and people could store their boat or their uh, trailer, camping trailer, uh, provided that they had a camp uh, night um, booked within two weeks. And that became very popular, and we calculated it would save 20% on their fuel. And that resonated. That was so popular. That got on the uh, Associated Press and was in all the major newspapers around the country at that time. But it was a simple idea that spawned, and we did it. Um, and uh, the, uh, um, the sustainable contraction, what that's about is as we were looking at improvements that we were making and not only using green technology and sustainable building practices, because we knew if we're going to build something like on-demand hot water heaters, solar tubes, skylights, things like that that could reduce the amount of recurring energy that was used that we could save money uh, on the bottom line. Again, that's something we can control, and we could prove that these investments were worth it. Well, one of the terms we uh, adopted was sustainable contraction. Well, sustainable contraction basically means is when you're looking at uh, facilities that you have that need to be renovated or fixed uh, or, or, or something, uh, do we really need the facility, first of all, what is its main purpose? Is it being used the way it was intended and built? Uh, for example, there are some parks even in cities that have picnic shelters that are probably overbuilt or in the wrong place, and but people keep maintaining them simply because they're there. And so the question is, or a number of ball fields, we know, for example, uh, I'll just, I'm just using that to just to round this out for other uh, types of venues. But we know that softball, adult softball, uh, uh, when I worked in Ann Arbor, we had 650 teams. Now they're down to less than 100. Well, the question is, do you need all the ball fields? And are there other recreational things that you could repurpose the fields for? For example, do you need all the backstops and all the stuff, or do you just keep them up just because they're there? So at any rate, that's what that means, is basically making sure that you're building. And in some of our places, we ended up taking out uh, and consolidating some uh, activities and stuff in one building and, and got rid of one in, in, and only had to rebuild or rehabilitate one. So that's what that means. And then, of course, the green initiatives was to continue the effort I mentioned earlier, but also to try to uh, encourage uh, across the system, which led to things like we, um, we uh, this is before the legal law came into play, but we uh, had rules put in place that we would no longer buy incandescent bulbs. And everything had to be, you know, a certain model and wattage and all that junk. And then we had other principles, like we added uh, some stormwater gardens, we did recycling, we added a number of uh, things into the uh, pot. So that's what those were about. Sorry, I jumped the gun on that slide. <laughs> nope. All right. So I think um, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we're, we've, uh, we're doing now. So even though we started with those uh, chief's challenges that we talked about before, we've actually, uh-oh, um, we've actually learned quite a bit about, um, we've learned quite a bit about what works for our staff and what doesn't. So. I wanted to share a few things of uh, ideas that we're doing now, um, but also to give the uh, the word to the wise that you always have to be innovating your innovations because uh, we had that chief challenge that worked out really well for many years, and then it got to a point where uh, we kind of thought, well, we need to restructure it a little bit because I think uh, we had a lot of new staff people coming in. They were uh, they had a different skill set. Some of them were a little bit more versed in business plans, not so. Um, a couple of the attachments that are we are providing, one shows the original targets of opportunity when people were asking for 
um, if it, when they were asking for those grants up to $15,000. Um, that was the original plan that we did, um, or the, the business plan that we asked them to complete. And then now we've, we've kind of morphed it a little bit after getting some staff feedback because after about six, I think it's about six years of people getting used to that program and doing it, they kind of got to a point where they're like, well, we've kind of submitted all of the ideas that are coming to mind. We actually took a break for a couple of years and then we used those funds for other things. And now we're coming back to it, but we've reformatted it based on the feedback we received. Well, it, it takes a lot of time to fill out the form. I don't really know how to calculate return on investment. I don't really know if I can do one every single year um, and I you know do I do I have to and so we changed that program a little bit and I'll come back to that but I, I, I wanted to start out with um, some of the ideas or innovations that we've uh, found are worth sharing okay so um, one thing that we've discovered is that um, in in our uh, in our world of, of being a state agency, there are a lot of requirements when it comes to purchasing. There's a lot of requirements when it comes to policies and um, how we manage our lands. One of the things that was really important to us is that we at least get to try something. And so we like to call this the genius of the pilot. <laughs> so it's a great way to try something new without necessarily making a long-term commitment. Because, so for us, one of the pilots we're doing right now is pet-friendly lodging, not just taking your pets camping with you, but also being able to have them in, um, in your cabin or in the lodge that you're staying in. And we know that West Virginia had some great success with that. And we know that there's some other states that aren't comfortable touching it. And so that's why it was really important for us to at least pilot it and see how it works. So we have five locations, we're trying it out small, we're doing lots of evaluation. And then because of that, it gave us some avenues to get around some of the red tape and also help us make a better policy if this is something we want to do moving forward. Um, of course, if you're going to do a pilot program, make sure that any possible person that could say no, make sure that they're a part of it. Make sure that you're bringing them in the loop. And, uh, and that's, that's helped us push a lot of innovations through that otherwise probably would have stalled out when somebody said, well, that's against policy. Or, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that because we'd have to make a change to our, uh, you know, a land use order. So uh, I cannot say enough good things about the pilot. The other thing is we just talked about bringing in as many brains as you can and also changing that uh, the way we were doing our marketing innovations team, uh, the targets of opportunity, which is a, one of the chief challenges. Um, one of the things that we heard was, um, I, I feel like I'm not doing this right or I don't know how to fill out the business plan. So we took some of that pressure off of our staff once we, re, once we brought this uh, back to the forefront this past year. And we actually brought a team of people together, and that team's gonna refresh every single year. And it's a team of people that say, I wanna push the envelope. I wanna try something different, and I wanna know what other people are doing. So we have them come in, and it's a cross-section. We have an account tech, we have our a park manager, we have a district supervisor, we have our concessions manager. We just have a cross-section of people that are helpful in helping us move the ball forward. We also include, depending on what issue is being brought to the forefront or what idea, um, we make sure that anybody who could potentially oppose the idea or who could be impacted by it, we make sure that they're brought into the conversation as well. And we do by teleconference, so it's quick. Um, and so that's another one of the handouts. It's the, um, it's kind of our process that we go through. And there's just a really quick form. People answer some basic questions. If all of the information we need to have a, a conversation isn't supplied to me prior to the meeting, I work with the person submitting the idea and we get all the information we need, we have a conversation. From that conversation, additional research may be needed. So then we assign who's going to do that and kind of go from there. So um, the innovations team has been a great way for us to keep innovation, this idea, this culture of innovation on the forefront, but then we made it as easy for staff as possible. Some of the ideas that this uh, team has looked at were our aqua parks. Um, and that's the picture you're going to be looking at here. It's uh, basically trampolines on water, which, again, not something you would think, or at least in Michigan, not something that is a normal Michigan State Park experience. But now we have them in three different locations, um, and we provide those three concession agreements. Um, we've talked about pump tracks, solar showers, paddle camping, vintage camper concessions. I even put on here nude beaches. And I know, Ron, Ron just got a little nervous. But yeah. we... After we talked through it, we realized, but it was an idea, and it's something we're not currently doing. 
And one of the things that's really important to our innovation scheme is that regardless of how much it makes you cringe or you think, ugh, sometimes that feeling is how you know you're on the right path. If it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, it means you're doing something different that's never been done before. I will say that we decided that um, that was probably not something that we wanted to do, didn't necessarily fit with our mission, but at least we gave it a good, um, a good discussion and we actually looked at some pros and cons. So that would be something I would highly recommend is don't be afraid to look at things that you're afraid of. For example, um, one of our first pilot programs that we did that we're super proud of is this uh, Wines of Michigan's Great Outdoors. One of the great things about this program is that we basically had put out into the world that we wanted to partner with uh, any business that was interested in helping us raise funds to make our system sustainable. As you saw in the first slide, we were up against some pretty significant financial challenges. Um, and you know what, sometimes it's, you're not gonna get a donor that gives you $2 million at a time. Sometimes it's just a matter of um, finding some donors that are not only willing to give you money, but also helping you tell your story. Um, one of the links that I wanted to share, and I have to escape, get out of my PowerPoint here, and head over to the website, is this one. So Chateau Grand Traverse, uh, they are a partner of ours, and they've actually dedicated an entire page of their website to these three custom label wines that they produce. We don't pay them anything, they just give us 50% of their net proceeds. They actually are very proud of what they're doing. They help us tell our story and how people can support uh, the project. So it's, they see this as more than just another part of their business. They see this as, um, I guess, if you will, it's an affinity marketing effort. Affinity marketing is saying, finding something that people are passionate about and creating a product that aligns with that passion so they're passionate about your product. And that's really what this, this is, and really what the next few that I'm gonna be talking about are all about. Because one of the things that we are so fortunate to uh, have as far as an asset, not only do we have the opportunity to be managing our natural resources, but we get to be the stewards and the face of those natural resources. So that's what a lot of, in Michigan, we get more than 27 million annual visitors. That's a huge number of people that have one common interest. And that's what uh, businesses like Chateau Grand Traverse see as being valuable. So um, also, they did something I thought was really clever, and that's right down here. Your outdoors, your vote. So we wanted an additional way to tell some of the things that we're doing in state parks. For example, we want to improve our recycling. Um, we want to put in natural-based playgrounds. A lot of the playgrounds that we have are kind of these built structures, and we want to remind people that it's okay to play on trees and rocks, but of course you still have to make sure it's accessible. So um, these are some of the things that we wanted to make sure we were telling that story. So now, each year, instead of them, the business saying, I want the money to go toward trail maintenance, the owner of the company is really into trails, um, they said, pick three things that you want people to vote on, and then we'll manage a voting system for our, our customer, and we'll let you know which one wins. So last year, tree replacement won. So all $10,000 of this campaign, the 50% of the net proceeds that they donated to us, went back to replace trees that had been lost in our state parks because of disease or infestation. And it's great because down here, we're able to tell that story. So they reach people that we wouldn't. So going back to what Ron was talking about, of we need to increase our relevance, we wanted to increase our relevance to an audience that maybe doesn't regularly talk to us doesn't come regularly visit us but yet they love they love picnics they love boating they love being you know they love the fact that Michigan has such beautiful woods so even though they're not active visitors there's this is still an opportunity for us to reach them okay hey Maya this is Hannah it looks like the screen might be frozen on the wine page oh okay hold on let me see Has it, it should be coming up. There, it looks like something's happening. Okay. We, sh I, we should be back on my... I'm seeing uh, the wine of Michigan. Okay, good. And in a minute, it'll switch to the next slide. Okay. So, our next partner that we have is um, Espresso Royale, and they wanted to do something similar to the winery. They are doing five custom-labeled 
coffees that they sell throughout the state and they without even knowing what their distribution was going to be through our major outlets they said we really believe in what you do and want to support it so we're willing to make a minimum ten thousand dollar donation Fifty cents from every bag so if we go over ten thousand we're going to give that to you but um we want you to know no matter what even if we fail at this we still want to give you ten thousand dollars which is great so this is a great opportunity for us to then share um Again, an audience, you know, like we, we've heard, 70% of, of Americans wake up and drink coffee. Um, it's a good way to reach out to more people than we probably see in our parks. We have a similar campaign with Labatt Blue where they said um, they do a two-month custom packaged uh, beer. And as you can see at the, the top of the packaging, they basically say right there, Labatt USA and many generous partners are supporting the Michigan Department of Natural Resources to protect the places that make Michigan great. Now, what's interesting about this is they said, we'll probably give you about $20,000 for the two month campaign. That's about what they're estimating based on how much they donated last year through their triple bottom line. This is something that Labatt's does in every single state. It's just a matter of working with their local marketing manager to let them know that you're interested in being a, uh, a recipient of funding for their triple bottom line campaign. We managed out of the distri uh, distributors, and the distributors forged an agreement with um, uh, Labatt USA on our behalf. So that's how we do that. And, and I should take a step back and say our process, you might be thinking wine and beer, it's not going to work for me, or how do you find the businesses? Every year we put out a press release. And that press release is our public announcement to any business that we are looking for partners who are interested in a revenue share. Um, and we, we're open, let us know. And it's interesting because each year that we've done it, the first year I had maybe two, the next year I had about 10, this last year that I did it, I had 42 businesses respond. We've had a tremendous amount of response to this because they see these products on the shelves and they're starting to realize, oh, I might be able to help my business and it, uh, create a mutually beneficial relationship by marketing or you know talking to the audiences that are passionate about outdoor recreation and state parks. In fact, we had so many that we actually had to create an overall campaign <laughs> because it was hard to market all the different ones. So now we have something called "These Goods Are Good for Michigan," and I just want to show you really quick. We're actually it, because this is our kind of our new. It hasn't even been launched publicly yet. Um, on our new website, I'm going to go over here to, this is what our, this is our These Goods Are Good for Michigan uh, website. And you can see we've got our first three partners on here. Hey, Maya, I'm just seeing the presentation slide screen. Oh, hold on. It might take a minute, maybe? Um, are you seeing it on your screen? I am, yeah. Matthew, do you have any suggestions here? Hmm. I don't know why that is. Ron, are you seeing it on yours? Um, I see it because there are so many more. Right, I'm seeing the presentation screen. Um, hold on. Oh, I see. Hold on. That's weird. It worked the last time. Are you sharing as desktop or sharing? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try that. Hold on. How does that work? Still seeing. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Okay. So these are the. This is the. These goods are good for Michigan. One other thing I wanted to mention about this. The reason there it's not live yet is because we can't just put it on our website. So a word to the wise and save yourself from even having to talk to your tech people. If you plan to go a route similar to this, um, you probably, if you have a .gov URL, so if your web address is uh, you know, stateparks.gov, you won't be able to do something like this because it's technically, it would put into jeopardy your .gov URL. That's actually only allowed for certain, um, it's only allowed for certain uh, kinds of use. So if you're going to be promoting private businesses, then you're going to probably need to find a, uh, you know, buy a new URL and just do a redirect from your page, which is what we're doing. So what you're looking at right now is the page that's going to be live. It's going to be goods, 
for the number four mi.com. So we're gonna have a .com and then we're gonna be adding, so right now we have these three and then I have three more in the hopper and then like I said, we've had about 42 and we just have, it's a matter of going through and forging these cooperative agreements that really outline what are we doing, what are they doing, and uh, what makes sense. So, all right, I'm gonna go back now, my presentation. Okay, and then on the last point, and I, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Ron for this one, is when you think about innovations, um, one of the best things that somebody told me was think big. So I often, I like to sometimes, you know, it's fun to think small because those are quick, low-hanging fruits that you can make happen right away. But don't be afraid to think big. And I think this, this Outdoor Adventure Center is one of the biggest ideas I, I could possibly imagine. And I, I was so honored to be able to be a part of the implementation process. And it was really neat to see this kind of innovation in all of the different aspects of what it took to get it from um, idea to implementation. It's just really interesting, but so worth it now that we're seeing the, the fruits of our labor. So Ron, I, I know we have a video to share with us, but if you wanted to say anything yeah I mean uh, when we were this is in downtown Detroit and it's hard to, to show the scope of it but basically this was a building built in the late 1800s that was left and that uh, was in very decrepit shape but the bones of the building were good and we had a state park right across the street was which was transformed from about the old cement silos and the industrial complex of the past and we reformed it and um, one of the things that uh, when I was standing out there when we announced I introduced the governor and the director of the DEQ to announce the cement silos were coming down we did <clears throat> did that and the following week they started work on that but while we were down there uh, and I could see that we needed to find and again innovative ways to be relevant to younger people and people particularly in urban areas that uh, haven't had nor the opportunities as was described earlier to get outdoors and experience things. So the vision we had, as I said, I stood there and I said, wouldn't it be cool someday to have a hands-on experiential place where you could see what it's like to ride a snowmobile, ride a kayak down a river, to see what a waterfall looks like, catch a fish or whatever it is on the Great Lakes. And so we made a big long list of recreational activities and then try to say if we could reproduce those and have hands-on experiential things that you could actually do, watch videos or of, of scenes of actual trails, and say the Upper Peninsula and ride on a snowmobile simply like or uh, you know, a hunt or whatever it is. So anyway, bottom line is we get that vision and the landless we pushed it and we uh, got it done. So we got a video that we're going to show. I don't know if it started already, <laughs> but that gives you the idea uh, of what we ended up with. But it was a cool public private partnership. We did this in a very unique way. And uh, But let's show you the slides uh, or the, the very brief video. It's, it'll speak for itself. The Outdoor Adventure Center near Detroit's Riverwalk showcases all the natural beauty that Michigan has to offer. From freshwater lakes to sand dunes, get a closer glimpse at Michigan's wildlife. Delve beneath the surface and learn about fish or soar high above the treetops from a full-sized eagle's nest. You can experience all four seasons of outdoor activities in one fun-filled afternoon. Climb aboard an airplane to see how... In Department of Natural Resources fights wildfires and monitors wildlife from the air with interactive exhibits, hands-on activities, and a wide range of simulators. You can hike a trail, go fishing, get a camping trip in, and even try snowmobiling. Learn about the ways you can protect our natural treasures and how you can take the next step to explore Michigan's outdoors. Visit up north downtown at the new outdoor adventure center open wednesday through sunday near the riverfront in detroit the outdoor 
That's the exterior of the building, and you can see real quick, that's what it looks like from the third floor. But there's a lot of stuff, and it's been a huge success. And uh, we, uh, like I said, we did this very uniquely. It was the first time we ever did a public-private partnership, and we love it from some other stuff. So it's a whole story in and of itself. But again, it's one of those visions we put into action uh, that has uh, great results. And we now have a much huger uh, presence in Detroit, and it's improved our relations, plus uh, it's given some great relevance to the waterfront, which we're partners with the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. We also manage Belle Isle Park uh, in downtown Detroit, too. But anyway, that we wanted to uh, give you a glimpse of that. I believe that is our last. Is that the last slide? I believe so. I'm not it. Oh, oh. Out of question. Yeah, we just wanted to now see if we're about five minutes over, uh, but we wanted to see if there's any, anybody has questions or anything. You can type questions that you may have in the chat box or try using your microphone. Thank you, Ron and Maya. What an inspiring presentation. I'm really impressed by everything you've accomplished. Thank you for having us, Hannah. Yeah. Well, hopefully it'll get played over and people can see it and let us know what they have. I have um, a question. With the green initiatives, I was wondering, um, I was really impressed by all you, all you have done with that, and I was wondering if you received any any pushback. Was everyone on board with those initiatives, and how did you deal with any of that uh, resistance, if you experienced any of that? Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, we did. You know, I mean, there were people that, uh, you know, like a lot of things, whether they're all in or not. But uh, generally speaking, I think people were happy and pleased to be given the opportunity to do things. Part of the challenge was to get people to think creatively and, you know, participate. Mm -hmm. I really liked the mountain bikes transition there from the trucks. I bet it's a lot quieter, too, and less, less smelly. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you save money and you're getting your staff healthier. And it's interesting, there was some pushback on that. But what we actually found is you could see some parks actually had a little bit of a culture shift. Um, once they realized and actually went through it, well, this isn't so bad. I mean, we all love riding bikes as kids. When did that stop? Right. That's yeah. great. How about grants? Um, you mentioned the geothermal heating. Did you did you come across any grant opportunities for those green initiatives? Um, yeah, I think, uh, we may have had one or two, but most of them were we just rolled with what we had. And then that partnership with North Face is that uh, the North Face approach you, or is that something that? we heard about and contacted them about? Um, we actually had an agreement with Good Solutions Group, which I know a lot of states do. Um, the idea behind that was Good Solutions Group was kind of like our bird dog. They actually did a, a welcome map uh, for us before. They called it the welcome kit, where it used to have coupons and stuff, and we went just to a foldable map. Um, and so they work with a lot of businesses and then would share opportunities of, you know, if there was an interest, they would share that with us. Well, we don't actually work with Good Solutions Group anymore. Um, they no longer provide our map, and so um, we realized that we, we are going to be just as successful if we reach out to some of those businesses directly. And it's, you know, Gander Mountain, I just went to the local Gander Mountain, explained what we were trying to do, and then they advocated for us, which is really great. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It looks like we had um, Ken Riquez join us during this presentation. I'm not sure. Um, they're still on the line. I have any questions? If not, then we'll wrap up here. All right. 
Well, hopefully uh, we'll get close it up and let me advertise it. So when you get it set, you'll let Lewis and them know so they can put it up on. Okay, I will let him know that it's available. Wow. Okay, thank you. Thank All you. right, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Maya. Bye. Bye.